everyone. Welcome to the latest IOP speaker series event, African Democracy and the Balance. My name is Adia Dugal, and I am a first year student from San Francisco, planning to double major in political science and business economics. I recently became involved with the Institute of Politics and a member of UC Dems. I am honored to be introducing today's esteemed panel of speakers, Ambassador Gita Pasi, Professor James Robinson, Mr. Yinka Arogoke, and Mr. Mvemba Fezo Dizolele. I will start by introducing the ambassador. Ambassador Gita Pasi is an alum of Duke University where she earned her bachelor's degree and also attended the, universe, the New York University. She has served as US ambassador to Djibouti, Chad, and Ethiopia, along with serving as principal deputy to the assistant secretary of state affairs for secretary of state for African affairs beginning in 2018. Ambassador Posse also speaks French, German, Hindi, Romanian, and Russian. Wow. Next, I would like to introduce Professor James Robinson. Professor Robinson is an economist and political scientist who has taught at institutions such as USC, Cal Berkeley, and Harvard. He became a Maroon in 2015, where he is now a professor in the Harris School of Public Policy Studies, along with serving as the director of the Pearson Institute. He focuses much of his research on how different political and economic structures can lead to very divergent outcomes between countries. Now, I am excited to introduce Mr. Yinka Adagoke. Mr. Adagoke is currently the edit editor of Semaphore Africa. He previously served as editor for strategic initiatives at Rest of World, launched Quartz Africa, and also founded social media week Lagos. As a journalist, he has reported from more than 20 countries across Europe, Africa, and the Americas. Did I already say wow? Last but not least, I would like to welcome Mr. Mvembo Fezo Dizolele, a proud UChicago alum. Mr. Dizolele is a writer, independent journalist, and foreign policy analyst. He is currently a senior fellow and director of the Africa program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He has covered elections in several countries, including when he was embedded with UN peacekeepers in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Mr. Dizolele is a veteran of the United States Marine Corps, and he is fluent in French, Norwegian, Spanish, Swahili, Kikongo, and Lingala, and is proficient in Danish and Swedish. I'm all out of wows. Thank you all again for taking time out of your days to be with us. I am thrilled to get this conversation started with such a wonderful panel. Before we start this conversation, just a few administrative reminders. Please silence your phones, and when we get to Q&A, a microphone will be placed in between the aisles, and as always, we will give priority to students. Don't forget the next two events in our speaker series. On Wednesday at 12 p.m., the IOP will host Mitt Romney's Truth, a conversation between McKay Coppins and David Axelrod. And on November 7th, the IOP will host a conversation on anti-trans politics, how we got here and where we are going. To find out more about these amazing speakers, please visit the IOP website. Without further ado, I'm excited to turn this over to our wonderful, wonderful panel of speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Adia. Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to be uh, with you tonight. The topic at hand is one that is very critical uh, with Africa, particularly for the development of the future of Africa. Just quickly, a few years ago, I showed up in the Democratic Republic of Congo as an observer for the elections there. And a friend had given me some stuff to deliver to her father. I called her father, and he said, why are you here? Uh, are you reporting? Are you I said, I'm here for the elections. And he said, why do you do this? I'm like, dude, what? He said, observe these elections. You know I can tell you the results already. 
Do you want me to tell you now, or do you want me to tell you after your observation? I said, go ahead, what do you think? He said, well, pretty much your group will say, despite all the irregularities, the elections were fine. And so this is the problem really we're facing on the continent. Our topic today says democracy in the balance. But the reality is, I will contend that democracy has never taken hold on the continent. The few countries that have done fine, very few, you can count them on maybe three fingers. The rest of the countries have had elections regularly, so much that they tend to call them selections. Um, but the, the other part of it never came, and that is governance. Good governance never came. So every four years, every five years, depending on the country, people line up, they really believe in these things, and then it never really delivered. So the result today is such as there is high public discontent. If you read Afrobarometer, there was a time where there was a high level of commitment to democracy and a high level against coup d'etat. But now, the uh, feeling towards coup d'etat is pretty high now. People are kind of somewhat favorable to them. Not that they want them, but the question is why not? Why not, don't we try something that we've not tried in a long time. Maybe this is the way to go. Mm. So today to my panelists, my fellow panelists here, I would like to say welcome. And uh, where are we in this state of democracy? Uh, starting with Ambassador Paisi. Last time I saw you, we were in Ethiopia, and you was the elections there. Well, thank you, it's great to be here. It's really an honor, and thank you very much. You know, I wanted to step back a little bit about not whether there is or isn't democracy, but many people don't think about Africa that often. You just read in the paper something horrible happened or there was a coup d'etat. We've read that in the paper or seen that on the internet a number of times in the last couple of years. And I would say that, I wouldn't go so far as to say democracy hasn't taken hold. I would say Africans, when polled, say they want democracy. They also say, when polled, that they don't believe that what they're getting is democracy. Mm. Whatever it may be called, it's not satisfactory. And there are a few facts. When I was um, in another part of the world, the ambassador once said, everything you say about this country is true, and the opposite is equally true. So I don't want to generalize about a continent with where one in four people in the world will be living by 2050, a continent that has 54 countries. but. There is a lot of nuance in these countries. And I think, you know, Africa has immense wealth. Africa has immense poverty. Africa, see, you can see incredible development in some parts of Africa. And you can see areas which, frankly, you know, would bring tears to anyone's eyes when you see how, how really bad off some people might be. But some of the world's, some of the other facts that I think are very important, Africa has a huge youth population. And if you haven't read anything by Declan Walsh, the journalist, I highly recommend you do. He just wrote an article about why the world is becoming more African. There are famous Nigerian musicians, there are fashion designers from Africa, art artists, all kinds of people are influencing the world, not just Africa, but the whole world. You might not be able to get a ticket to some of these concerts in New York when a Nigerian star is performing. And I think that that's something that is pushing Africa in a different direction. The leaders in African countries tend to be quite elderly. In fact, I joined the Foreign Service in 1988. Of course, there were no child labor laws. I was about 10. But <laughs> the president of Cameroon was Paul Bia, and he's still the president of Cameroon. And I think the median age in the continent of Africa is about 19. So half of the people fall below the age of 19. These are not people that are going to settle for what their parents or grandparents had. They have internet, they have contact with students around the world, including people like you, and they see that there's a better future and they want that future. I don't wanna go so far as to say there are no challenges. There are immense challenges, but people want democracy however you want to define it. And many people may not resist or be opposed to a coup because it's a change. If what you have doesn't work, there might be hope in the future offering. The problem is that some leaders stay forever. I would be nervous if I had been president of an African country for four decades right now. 
Um, and some military leaders don't want to turn the country back to civilian rule. So how you define democracy could change. It might depend on how you look at it. But Africa is poised in many ways to move forward at a rapid pace. And there are a lot of people in Africa, young uh, people, and it will be a very important part of the world. It is, but it's going to take on more economic and social significance in the decades to come. So I'll leave it there for now, but just say that we should broaden our aperture a bit as we talk about Africa. Thank you. Professor Robinson. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Democracy hasn't taken hold in Africa. You'd like me to talk about that. I mean, I, you know, I think, I think there's sort of three, I think there's three things that I would, three issues I put on the table. You know, I mean, I sort of agree with that. Um, and, you know, if I, why, why would democracy not have taken hold? Like, for me, the fundamental problem in post-colonial Africa is trying to find a working social contract. You know, if you think about a country like Nigeria or the DRC, you know, this was a colonial construction made up by throwing hundreds of different societies with different histories, different cultures, different, very different political institutions into something, it, something calling it Nigeria or calling it the DRC. And creating a national government and a political system that actually didn't look like any of those traditional political institutions. So I think, you know, the great Nigerian soci uh, sociologist, Peter Eke, sort of said in the 1970s that the problem in Africa is, is that there's a sort of, there's a local, there's local legitimate institutions and local, he used the word moralities, you know. Uh, but the problem in Africa is they haven't been able to project that up to the national level so that local society may work very well. It can be intensely democratic, but, the national system, it hasn't managed to filter up to the national system. So I think that's, that's still, you know, and if you look at the parts of Africa where there has been democratic successes like Botswana, there's exactly a case where there was some kind of ability to take traditional institutions, rebuild them in a modern liberal democratic nation state, and there was some kind of mapping between those institutions and modern institutions of accountability, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you could also think of Somaliland in the last, it's not really a country, but in the last 30 years, you know, again, you have a more homogeneous kind of political culture and political society where they're able to negotiate a national political institutions, their own political institutions, not something left behind by the Belgians, you know, half an hour before they left. Mm -hmm. Their own institutions, kind of based on their own way, their own cultures. So I think those examples, you know, suggest that's a big problem, you know. The, the second problem I would say is, again, you know, is that these, you know, which is related to the first maybe, is that, you know, we talk about democracy and many traditional African political institutions were extremely democratic, but others were not, you know. There's other types of political institutions which can be legitimate, even if they don't look like modern democracy. In my personal experience of working in Africa, you know, if you look at many political institutions in East Africa, you know, where traditional society was based around age grades, okay? That was a perfectly rational and legitimate way of organizing society. Nobody was voting for anything, you know, in Nigeria. You know, you can have political systems based on age, you know. And, and so, so, so I think that's also an issue, like the, in thinking about democracy, you know, and, the, and kind of the problems with democracy in Africa, in my experience, you have to come to terms with the fact that Legitimate political institutions in Africa don't always look like Western liberal democracy. Uh, and then I think the third point, you know, and this is probably pretty evident in the, you know, we'll probably get to this, but the, all of these coups that have been happening in Francophone Africa is the endless kind of post-colonial meddling, you know. I mean, I think what's interesting about Botswana and Somaliland is just by chance, some sense, by historical contingency, they got the space to sort of build institutions themselves without someone trying to mess about with those institutions. Where if you think about the, the history of the Congo, there's just endless attempts to kind of intervene and influence the construction of 
Congolese institutions and push the society that way or push the society this way to take money, steal money, you know, like so. So the Africans never get the space and the kind of leeway to just build a different type of social contract and try to build the institutions that they want. Of course, that's a, you know, that's a sort of platitudinous thing to say in such a heterogeneous place, but maybe it needs to be more decentralized or maybe they find different ways of doing things. I always like the example in Somaliland, you know, that in the United States, we have a Senate and the Senate represents a piece of dirt, you know, whatever it is, it's called Illinois and it gives Illinois two senators. But in Somaliland, that just makes no sense whatsoever. You know, Somali people are, they move around, they're, they're pastoralists, they take, move around with their flocks. You don't want to represent a piece of dirt that might not be anybody there when the election comes. So what did they do? You don't base the Senate on that, on geographical constituencies. You base it on the clan. That's, that's the logic of Somali society. So I think that's a sort of brilliant innovation that some British colonial official would never have thought of, or some Belgian or French. But the Somalis, for them, that's the sort of logic of their society, and they can construct political institutions based on that logic. And I think, I mean, that's just one example, but it seems we just need a lot more things like that. So, Inka, we've heard a couple perspectives mm. here. One, the diversity of Africa is a continent. Mm. 54 countries, median age 19, a lot of pressures, both democratic, uh, demographic, but also in terms of expectations. Mm. The youth are not their parents. Mm -hmm. They've shown that they can mobilize. We've seen movement, Yanamar, Bali Citoyen, and SARS, and so on. Yeah. And often these youth are very successful in the short term. They've driven out dictators, they've stopped temperance with uh, the constitution and so on. They don't have staying power. So that's one area. But then to go to the professor, there's an issue of, does the Westphalian state that we've come to accept so much, that the social contract, uh, the African countries have never had the chance to work, to work out whatever this means. So Nigeria is a country of a multitude of ethnic groups. Today is 200 plus million people. The DRC is the size of Western Europe. So if you take the Congolese who live on the Atlantic coast and you compare them to the Congolese who live on the border of Sudan, it's like Portugal and Norway. They have nothing in common beside the fact that the Belgian had put them together in this country. So it feels like African countries have been in a post-authoritarian transition for 60 years mm. in the bigger part. Colonization was not a social contract, was not a democracy. So they had to go from one form of oppression, which was the col colony, and then they had this experiment that quite has not worked and quickly went in the, into either military coups or strong men who were civilians. You've covered a lot of these countries. What is your perspective on this? Um, so long as we're quoting great Nigerians, and anyone who reads um, any of my columns will know, I, I never miss an opportunity to quote the great Velakuti. And I, and I, always, I remember the, the, the line from uh, Teacher, Don't Teach Me Nonsense, which is literally about the hypocrisy of the West and, and it's sort of, sometimes we support the democracy, but if the right person is in there, we'll ignore it, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, and he has that funny line about what is this, this democracy that you guys keep on talking about? Democracy. They're all crazy. Are they all crazy? They're like, crazy. this doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, you know, two million people voted, you had 10 million people won. Like, like how, how, how are you doing this? But I think the key point, the, the really serious point about this is, is that those two were social contract, right? Like, it doesn't matter. Nobody, most of these countries, particularly once you leave the cities, where the majority of Africans live, they never have any interaction with the government. It doesn't do anything for them. Why, why should they care, right? And yet we keep on, this system exists and, and, and there's a whole sort of ecosystem around it, backed by, particularly by Western countries that, oh, if we just have this democracy, it's all, it will all be fine. And we'll let you into, what's the latest thing this week? A Goa or whatever it is, or some other thing. We'll, give you aid, or so long as you just go through this process. It doesn't matter whether that process actually works, whether it delivers the results 
that you know, we expect for development to move forward. So I, I just think that, um, yes, there's, you, somebody could make the case, well, we haven't come up with a better system, but as the professor says, well, maybe we just haven't explored enough different systems for these various societies that live, live within this country, these countries. But ultimately, regardless of what the system is, um, if it's not delivering on the social contract for the, the people of those countries, it's just, it's just a, a waste of time. The other point about the youth that I find fascinating that you, you talked about, um, I can't remember if we were saying that earlier or, or just here on stage, this idea that um, young people suddenly think this, the, the point about people, the average age being 19, and in some countries it's actually lower than that, right. the median age, right? You know, you talk to young people, they, they don't remember the last time there was a military government in Mali or, or, or Burkina Faso or whatever. So, of course, it seems like this, I mean, and they're saying all the right things. They're saying down with the French and they're saying all the, the stuff people want to, want to hear. And Russia is great, yeah, you know, all that stuff. And it might be true, right? But that doesn't mean these guys know much about what they're doing either. So, that, so, so ultimately, we still find ourselves going around in this circle as, how do you fix, is it really about the democracy? Is it really about the, the, the process? Or is it more about actually you know, delivering services to people, you know, all the things they expect from a government, from leadership? Delivering services, it's about good governance, mm -hmm. not about voting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There are countries around the world like Vietnam, even China, that are not known to be democratic in the way we think of democracy in the West, but they deliver. Mm. Um, starting with you, where is the gap? The gap between why that doesn't yeah, happen? Yeah, so if there's a coup in Vietnam, <laughs> everybody will be shocked. Mm. And there would actually be reason to say, why? Yeah. Because you look at the indicators, economic, social development, and others, Vietnam is moving forward. And this is a country that had war. This is a communist country. They've not dropped that way of thinking yet, but they're delivering. Mm. China is delivering, right? There are other issues, you may take issue with them, human rights and stuff, but people are not going hungry. People are not, not getting education, there's job and so on. So where is this gap on the continent? The gap between basically people, le people learning that it's about educating the population. The population not the being service. served. Yeah. Yeah, not getting access to services or lack of service altogether. Maybe it's more. Most a, candidates on the continent, as part of the campaign, do not say, I'm going to create X number of new jobs. Yet. In Kenya, was maybe an exception. Ruto, with his hustling nation, used, you know, we ran a campaign a la Western. Said about those things. The most candidates in most countries in Africa don't even use those things. Yeah, they, it's about more about taking care of the people. So that's what I'm asking we'll take, you, take, take, take starting with you. So yeah. where is the gap there? I mean, you can be a military leader and still deliver. You can be a communist leader like the Vietnamese and still deliver. So what we're saying is that it's not, not about the democracy, right? That we, we keep on coming back. Well, I'm just talking about the government. Like, why, why, why it's got to be why, democracy and why government. Why do they deliver? Yes. This is the eternal question. Yeah. Do you have a sense of why not? No, I don't actually. Okay. I'm Ambassador. Be other people. <laughs> well, I'm happy to take a stab. At that. <laughs> so, as you said, you're very correct that in many parts of many African countries, the government means nothing to the citizens. Mm. They're removed, days drive away, they don't get medical care, they don't get anything. And in some ways, when these governments change, it is as much um, a comment on the lack of services that citizens expect whether they're living in a democracy or a non-democracy, that their children should live beyond the age of five, that they should have clean water, that there shouldn't be you know, terrorism and insecurity um, next door. But I think also, it, you know, another issue in some of the countries where I've served or those countries that I have followed closely, you know, there are a lot of issues that could be wrapped up in corruption, that people could see government officials driving around in big cars, helping people in their ethnic group or people right. in their political party to the detriment of all others. So this lack of ability for everybody to get some piece of the pie, 
no matter how small it might be, builds, it ends up building a lot of resentment. And as far as candidates, I, I agree that some candidates may not say we're going to make sure there's a chicken in every pot or something like that, but there are advantages of incumbency in many countries that cannot be compared to the advantages of incumbency that we talk about in a country like the United States. I've seen many young political leaders who haven't been able to move forward. You know, they, didn't, they couldn't register their party. All kinds of impediments are put in their way. Now, some of those have a basis in law. I'm sure they do. I'm sure that representatives of those countries would disagree, but it is a fact that it's very hard for people to launch a campaign, to build, um, you know, any, to get even time on TV. And that's not something that was always the case in every country in the world, but it's still a big issue in, in, in many countries. So I think it's hard for people to get their views out there and very hard for them to make a change. It's not as though you elect someone and suddenly they're gonna develop industries and the country's gonna be wonderful. There are horrible challenges that have to be overcome. Mm. But when a government is displaced, whether it's really <laughs> truly democratic by any standard or not, it is really um, a vote by the people. When they're applauding, I think it's a vote by the people that this government wasn't doing anything for us. And they may court Russia, they may court China, you know, India, Turkey, the UAE, there are many countries opening embassies all over the continent who want to have ties with Africa. And it's going to be up to African countries to decide where their future, where they want it to be. And which countries, which are the countries with, with whom they would like to identify. But this is a challenge as much economic as political, I would say. So that ambassador is also an issue of sovereignty. You're touching on the issue of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. What does it mean for the sovereign, of course, is the people. The population is the sovereign. Sometimes we think of the leader as the sovereign, but it's really the population. So sovereignty then is about, I think that's one level just above in terms of representation <coughs> on the world stage, who decide who comes, who doesn't come. But I wanna go back, we're gonna hold this thought. I wanna go back to the professor, that gap between democracy the semblance thereof, or the illusion of democracy going to election, the pro and the, the bridge to the expectations, which is services. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I think the, the social science evidence is pretty overwhelming that democracies, if you compare democracies to kind of non-democracies, of course, the, the trick is that, that that's, they're enormously different. They're very different types of non-democratic regimes, and there's very different types of democracies. But if I just do the crude comparison, it's overwhelmingly true that democracies provide more public goods, they invest more in education and in infrastructure, and they grow more rapidly economically. Uh, that being said, of course, there's enormous variation in the types of dictatorship. But you know, here's what's interesting, is that very successful dictatorships, for some reason that no social scientist really understands, are all in East Asia, okay? So, so I always, you know, when people ask me about this, you know, I sort of say, yes, it's great if you can get a Lee Kuan Yew, but where do you find, where do you find that? You know, where do I find that in Nigeria? You know, I think the idea of democracy is that it's a way of trying to select people whose intentions align with the national interest. You know, and if I thought about Africa also, you know, of course you could think about Ethiopia under Mele Zanawi, or you could think about what Paul Kagame is doing now in Rwanda, but I think the Ethiopian case is interesting. You know, when Mele Zanawi was there, he was a very serious man, he was intelligent, he had a project, you know, to develop Ethiopia. As soon as he died, the project disappeared. It, it, it couldn't be institutionalized, you know? And the same thing will happen with Paul Kagame. Uh, but I also think if you look around, think in Nigeria, think of when, you know, President Tinubu was governor of Lagos State. There was, the military left, he came in, things moved, you know? Think about in Kenya also, after the one-party state, political competition. Yeah. Exactly. Things moved more, and there's good evidence on Kenya, you know? So, so I think you can, Think of examples of visionary sort of leaders like Kagame, maybe Thomas Sankara before he was murdered in Burkina Faso, you know, or maybe Jerry Rawlings for a bit, you know. But I think even the African evidence is sort of consistent with democracy sort of pushes people towards what individuals 
to what the collective interest wants. But the problem is it's very, very imperfect. You know, democracy is clientelistic and patronage ridden and, you know, and corrupt and, and all sorts of other things. And, and so it, the progress is just glacial compared to, to people's needs and people's aspirations. And, but I don't think, for me, there's not a viable alternative along the lines of East Asia because I just don't see culturally where that, those type of political projects come from. Do you think that's about from. individuals or do you think it's about the, the culture? I, I mean, I don't think anyone in social science really has a clue about why all of these developmental dictators, you know, are all in East mm. Asia. Like, there's never been a developmental dictator in Latin America. Is that, is that a coincidence? Pinochet. No, no, I don't Where, where so. will you put Pinochet? Huh? Pinochet. Economic performance, this is one of the biggest myths about Latin American economic history. Economic performance under the Pinochet dictatorship was appalling. It only improves after 1985, after he'd been in power for 12 years. In the previous 12 years, there were two enormous financial crises. Income per capita was the same as it had been in 1973. Okay? So, yeah, after 1985, there's a boom, mostly driven by very high copper prices. Now, can that be attributed to Pinochet? I mean, I think if you look to the details, you could say, sure, Pinochet did some things that were sensible, you know. But, but I think... This is, it's a myth that Pinochet gets the credit for what happened in Chile. You know, if you look at Chilean's distinct, Chile's distinctiveness, it long antedates the Pinochet dictatorship. Chile looks different from anywhere in Latin America in the 19th century, you know. So, 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 so I think, sorry, I shouldn't start ranting about that, but I feel, <laughs> right. I, do, I do feel passionate on that topic, okay. and we're getting off the theme. But you no, saw, it's, it's you part of the theme. Me. It's not, it's not off. You tempted because, me. Yeah. Because if we have dictators, and they come in different forms. They do different things. Just like democracies are not created equal. Norway is a democracy, but then it's homogeneous. Everybody's named Lars and Liv <laughs> and Svensson. So there is no psychological problem when a guy from Christian Sand shows up in Tromso. It's a very organic experience. That's the same in Denmark and Sweden. The UK is not the same. The, US, the UK has tribes, Scots, Irish, so they've struggled with the same type of situation that Africans have struggled with. They've struggled with them over centuries. So they've had time to tinker with different things and eventually find a political settlement. But it's not ended. Braveheart is not quite dead, right? Scotland wants to be part of Europe. England wants to be something else. They go to the World Cup under different banners. So there's a lot of issues there, but they find a settlement. Spain is the same. A lot of tribes there, Catalan, Gallegos, and so on, and every three years somebody wants to split, and it's often the same place. But they find, again, a political settlement that is working. In the case of Pinochet, we like to take some credit because of the Chicago boys. <laughs> so he did surround himself. At one point, he made a clear yeah. position that's going to hire all these economists, right. a lot of them trained from the University of Chicago. I was here at the time as a student. So we take credit for it. Here's a dictator who did things. So whatever the convergence of the commodity price and stuff, but that doesn't happen without Congo had, you, you, Congo had emerged. The copper price was very high under Kabila. Yeah. Congo did not benefit from that. Cool. So I just want to put that in you, context as do you well. Take, do you take credit for the massive increase in inequality also? In where? Chile. Well, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, eventually Chicago also he did policy. step down. So there are many things, right? He also did step down, which Kabila did not, right? Kabila had to be pushed out. So well, I'm saying we need to take all those things in consideration. Well, let's, you mentioned DRC yes. and resources. So, I mean, this is something to consider. Mineral rich country, incredibly wealthy. A lot of these rare earth minerals are essential. So we can have electric cars, so we can have iPhones, so we can have computers. I don't see that benefiting the average person in Congo. Someone's making money. Right. So this is another issue. It's not just, you know, not every person in Congo can be involved in mine work, but every person should benefit. be able to benefit from the work that goes on in those mines. Right. And I think that's a major challenge in a number of countries where their economy is totally based on some commodity. I think in Ghana and in Cote d'Ivoire, which are major cocoa producers, 
someone was, had reported that out of every dollar of cocoa sold, 10 cents goes to the farmer. So imagine, you know, next time we tuck into a candy bar that we realize that only 10% is going to the farmer and the rest is being handled by middlemen. So the other countries that are doing okay are not particularly democracy in the real sense as we see it, Morocco being one. Um, it's not a democracy as we see it today. So it's pluralistic in all kinds of ways. They find their own ways. But I think all of us will agree that the economic indicators in a place like Morocco is different than the rest of the continent. Botswana is also, obviously, its resource base, which is diamond. They figured a way to find a deal that worked for them. And they've gone through tremendous crises that they were able to weather, AIDS being one. At mm -hmm. one point, Botswana was almost wiped out. You know, they were graduating. More teachers were dying than they could train. But again, because of good governance, not just the democracy, they're able to provide, I mean, the world helping anti-retroviral drugs or things. But there were policies that were national that were able to meet foreign, foreign aid, so to speak, quote unquote, and they could deliver. So starting with you, Inka, mm. what do we do? Where do we go? About which one? About. <laughs> <laughs> because there are a lot of problems there. Well, this business of democracy election not working, and now we are in the new phase with coups. Coups are here. They're not going away anytime soon. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't believe in contagion, but the conditions that lead to coups are all over the place on the continent. So my bet will be that we need to expect a little more of them before they fade out again. Yeah. No, there, there are too many countries where, I mean, you and I spoke, I think, uh, when I, I had this story about the, the Congo Basin and, and the number of countries there which are ruled by these dictators who have been in power for, I don't know, some sort of average of like 25 years or something. We think about Cameroon, Cong Congo, um, Brazzaville, um, Equatorial Guinea. It, it, it just, the list goes on. These people have, have been there since the, 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 the 80s, the 70s. Um, those conditions mean there will, be, there will be rumblings and it becomes this kind of internal politics of those countries, right? Like it becomes about who within the inner circle can be trusted and who, who uh, supports, who is trusted within the presidency. It's certainly an issue with Cameroon. That's why they had the, the change of the military leaders there. Um, I think we will continue to see this, perhaps not coups, but just people getting ready uh, these, these leaders worried that, as you say, there is going to be a contagion and very soon the, you know, somebody will come knocking on the door and asking for people to make noise or something, right? This, this is, um, I just keep on coming back to the point. If, you, if, you, if, if your people, look at Gabon, right? This is, this is a country which had, what, what's its population, like two million? One point. Uh, one point, right. And at one point it was the fourth largest oil producer in Africa. And the people are poorer than countries that have much less, right? So how, how is this possible? But the families got built homes all over Paris and, and what have you, and they're flying in Bali and all this kind of bizarre stuff, right? And it's just gone on and on and on and on for decades. So we're, as, You've got all these young people who they've got the internet, they've had, they're, they're well aware. People are going to push back. We're just going to keep on seeing this kind of uh, resentment uh, being activated. Ambassador Passy, are we measuring the wrong things? So in the West, we talk about the fastest growing economies all being in Africa. It's only on paper. Right? Anybody who goes to Africa doesn't feel any fast growing. Anymore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But when you read everything in The Economist and everywhere else, you think they're speaking about a different country. Yeah? Those of us who spend a lot of time on the continent, talk to your taxi driver, talk to the mama at the market, she will tell you, Papa, people are starving. And she knows because she sells beans every yeah. day. In a society that eats beans every day, or flour, or bread, she knows people are not eating. Because when she used to sell six sacks a day, She's selling barely a bassinet. But yet in DC, everybody says it's the fastest growing economy. 
and they will give us a plethora of countries. Is this, we're missing something here? Are we so, so fixated in this liberal economic order that we're missing all the red light? Well, I would say that you can have both incredible wealth next to incredible poverty. This is an issue of distribution. You have very wealthy people who are involved in philanthropy on the continent. They're also running huge businesses. That doesn't mean that they feel it's their job to feed every citizen of their city or of their country. That is the job of governments. And then you get into, are they being taxed? Is there corruption? I mean, as we go back to the Congo case, where's all that money going from all the rare earth minerals? I, I think that the challenge is going to be what the people, I, I want to differentiate between what happened in Gabon. Gabon is you know, a longtime ruler who was the son of the president. People were probably fed up. That's not a Muslim country that has terrorism issues. It's very different than the coups in Burkina and other places. So the so-called coup belt, it, I, I think it's possible that French system was highly centralized and it led to a lot of, if the center is weak or people perceive the center is weak, then there possibly could be a move to displace the government. I don't think it's the wrong measurement. If we even look at our own country with all you know, due respect, I, I went to a farmer's market the other day and I walked by a building with about 100 people lined up who are homeless. You know, This is in Illinois and in an area of Illinois where things are going very well, in my opinion. So. I don't think we're looking at the wrong things, but we have to make sure that those countries themselves have to ensure that everybody's getting some benefit from the resources that exist. We can't order business people to do that. We can't order governments to do it. But I feel that there's a possibility now that many young Africans are going to speak up for themselves. Professor Robinson, African countries, there have been a number of African countries that really committed to the democratic process including Mali in 1990, after the coup, and the list goes on. But it's my view, and as we observe, that they don't do, always get the support they need post-electoral. So in other words, people had elections, but then there's no food, there's nothing. So we don't pump, we being the West. In Eastern Europe, there were countries that transitioned. Mm -hmm. They had elections, but then we pumped billions of dollars to ensure that institutions too cold and things. I've not seen anywhere in Africa where we've actually followed through with our promotion of democracy so that the, the governance part also will take hold. What do you say to that? Yeah, I think that's an interesting perception. I think that you know, many developing development institutions like the World Bank, for example, if you use the word politics at the World Bank, people start shaking. You know, and in fact, it's in the World Bank Charter that they can't have anything to do with politics mm -hmm. and they can't be involved in politics. And so they can't take seriously the issues that you're raising, in fact, the kind of institutional support that might be much more important than vast amounts of their development aid, you know, which, which gets squandered, or I mean, some of which does useful things and whatever. But, but, but I agree that there's a, I think, like, Governments, like you know, the British government or whatever, or the Swedish government, they have much more freedom to focus on institutional support or whatever. But I agree with you that you know, the, 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 there's, much more, um, there's much less focus on that than, than there should be. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Because I always get the impression that we tell the Africans, you have had your elections, now pull yourself by your bootstraps. Um, we've come to our Q&A time. So audience, it's all your show now. And they're all yours. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. Uh, my name is Uchenna, first generation Nigerian American out of San Jose, California, in the Bay Area. Uh, one of the big concerns that I have as a first generation Nigerian American is the notion or the idea that Nigerians here in the United States are some of the most high-performing, high-achieving people in the country. Uh, oftentimes, I think back to my parents' generation, which they consider the brain drain generation, where a lot of opportunity was presented for them to leave the country, to come here for an education, uh, and then provide for their family back there, and then also raise one here. So my question is, 
Uh, as a first generation Nigerian American, based off your expertise, what would you say is something that should be a top of mind for someone who's an American citizen, uh, dual citizen in some cases, if you're able to apply for that and get it in your home nation? Uh, what would you say would be the best recommendations, especially as someone in a policy school, that they should focus on? So as, for example, I myself have a tech policy vertical. I focus mostly on technology, which is a growing space. Um, how can we not necessarily just focus on the domestic policies or the international policies related to the United States, but also be able to then break off some of that expertise, not as tyrants of expertise to go over there and say that you could <coughs> teach them how to save themselves, but how can you actually work within collaboration? Um, can, we, can I suggest we take maybe three questions? Okay. Mm -hmm. This way and then, yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Anand. I'm a first year MPP. Uh, I have a question regarding the cultural and foreign policy of developing countries with the African uh, countries. Um, I mean, we also see there is a developing countries also following a kind of colonial uh, way of exploiting the African resources under the disguise of benevolent foreign policy. We see uh, developing countries from Asia, South Asia, um, involved in land grabbing in corporate farmings like Ethiopia, uh, we, uh, exploitation of fisheries, um, my mining exploitation, and also a kind of cultural soft power transition, like for example, in India's case, sending Gandhi to the Africa, but not sending Ambedkar or Fule to the Africa, which, is, which can actually build a strong global uh, alliance of liberation of marginalized sections of all over the world. Because the race and caste, I mean, there are people who have studied race and caste intersectionally uh, from past 60, 70, 80 years. But we don't see that coming. So my question is, are African policy leaders are aware of the fact that the kind of um, benevolent foreign policy that so-called developing nations are right now implementing <coughs> in Africa is again a kind of uh, disenfranchising the true African voice and disenfranchising the true global alliances of global marginalized South. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Next, that will be the last one. So Hi, my name is Ben. I'm a first year in the college. Um, and much of my family is from South Africa, and much of them, are, uh, many of them still live there. And when there's problems in South Africa, they like to uh, look to Botswana as, a, as, a, as an example. Um, and I was wondering, you, you mentioned the uh, conditions that allowed for like, institutions to build in Botswana um, that haven't been seen everywhere on the continent. Um, I was wondering if you think that that is something that is um, applicable to other countries, that those conditions are something that um, other countries could look um, um, look at um, uh, implementing themselves, or is that something? Is it is it a case of apples and oranges? Are they are they two different um, issues? Okay. Thank you very much, Ben. So you can take any question you want. I, I can I can go with the um, Nigerian American. Um, no, I, I think Uchinam asked a, a really good question. And it's funny, today the White House launched the um, uh, Africa Africa Diaspora, Diaspora Presidential engagement, Council. Engagement. Advisory. Yeah, yes, Presidential Council. Um, it's, it's become clear that even as to, to, the, the ambassador brought up culture earlier, that there's this um, connection between the African diaspora and um, and the West that's, and, and Africa that's become increasingly valuable. I, I used to cover the music business many years ago, and I, and I make the case now that Afrobeats wouldn't be Afrobeats without the diaspora because it had to be people who had the funds in the West to pay for Spotify, to pay for Apple, and all these things that could begin to fund. And I know this from talking to, to people who work at these, these, uh, these labels in Lagos. Um, so there's, there's an increase in value to, you know, just making that connection, working back and forth. Definitely in tech, huge, huge influence from uh, Nigerian Americans or Nigerians who've just come to work in, in the States fairly recently, uh, who are involved in both the funding and backing and, and speaking up for uh, tech companies 
in their country. You know, so um, I think that it's something to pursue. It's something to to uh, that we're going to. I think we're going to see a lot more of it. I think Nigerians right now, population size, size of the economy, kind of leading. But I think we'll, we'll see it from Ghanaians. We'll see it from uh, people from other countries, Ethiopia, um, over time. Thank you, Ambassador. Let me talk about the global south or. Yeah, Anand's question. Yeah. Yes, I mean, not just about what India might do, but the BRICs are growing stronger. Um, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China. I think it behooves every country on the continent of Africa to think about why they should have an alliance with another country. I mean, it's true that I think, Anand, you're alluding to this, but, you know, China has offered loans to many African countries, and the, the, um, repayment terms are really horrible. Um, worse than student loans by 10, if you can imagine, indebting tons of future generations. So I think you know, some, in some cases, Africa has taken part of a railroad or control of land. It, it was always a question in the minds of many, why is Ethiopia leasing land to countries to grow vegetables when people in their own country don't have enough to eat? I mean, it's not just ironic, it's sad. So, but every country has interests, and African countries need to look at why China or India or someone, what they're offering, and do they want that? And what are they giving in exchange? You know, the leaders in African countries are adults, they need to make these decisions. I personally feel, as someone who has represented this country for many years, that America offers other countries things that you know, the rest of the world cannot and does not. And I, I trust that with time, Many countries will see that. But right now, uh, Russia, China, other places are doing things. I will say that in terms of coups, um, there was just an article about Russian involvement in um, using technology, memes, different things in Burkina Faso that may, may have supported the coup. That was, I think, in the Washington Post. It's fascinating. So there's a lot of, you might think of going to, if you're in Burkina Faso, you might not have internet and your phone might work. But, Russian disinformation campaigns were apparently at work. It's fantastic journalism that has just come out. So I think there's a lot more going on. But again, people need to decide, like in any relationship, is what's in this for me and what's in it for the other side, and then make decisions. Thank you. Professor, okay, I think you left with the Botswana. You're left with why, Botswana. Why would we talk about Botswana? Which is good, which is good. Botswana for hours. <laughs> no, Okay. It's in your book, so, so that's so, good. <laughs> so I think, I mean, I think the Botswana experience is sort of unique in many ways, but it's also very interesting for other parts of sub-Saharan Africa. It's u unique in the sense that Botswana was, you know, first of all, the Swana themselves negotiated their own colonialism. You know, three of the chiefs went to London and realized they'd be better off as a British protectorate than being run by Cecil Rhodes' British South Africa company. So they, they manipulated the British into creating a protectorate to keep Rhodes off their necks. They innovated all sorts of institutions. I mean, and it's an amazing story. How are they able to get away with it? Because the British never governed what was then Bechuana land from Bechuana land. It was actually never governed from Bechuana land. It was governed from Mafeking and Vryburg in South Africa. So the British never even had an administration. So there's an amazing rearguard action. It's a long story. Keep the British, stop them prospecting for minerals, stop them implementing indirect rule, kind of trying to maintain the sort of legitimacy and coherence of their own institutions. And, and I think, so I think what's, that's unique. You know, there were very few, there were many parts of Africa in the colonial period and before the colonial period that tried to innovate. They saw what was coming, mm. tried to create structures, institutions, you know, modern, modernize, that's not a word I like very much. But anyway, you get the idea. But Botswana, mostly they were just crushed by colonialism, essentially. At Botswana, they got enough space, they got some breathing room, you know, and, and they managed to kind of maintain this thing into independence. Yet, there was a sort of homogeneity of political institutions within Bechuanaland and Botswana that made that yeah. job easier, I think. That's not like Nigeria. Yeah. It's not like Nigeria. But, but you know, but, but there's also great leadership and creativity there. You know, this wasn't an easy thing to do, and, and, and they deserve a heck of a lot of credit for, for, for doing it. You know, but, 
But, and one thing, let me say, you know, to come back to a kind of bigger issue that's come up here in terms of how heterogeneous, it is heterogeneous Africa, you know, but the thing is, Africans are, you know, like I'm an English people, you know, the English people are the worst in the world at this, okay? You know, everyone speaks all these languages. Every African I know speaks about five languages. Africa is the most multilingual part of the world because of all this heterogeneity. Africans are used to dealing with different people, different cultures, different history. Did you know that in nearly all African languages, the word for guest and stranger and foreigner is the same? Okay, why? Because Africa's Lingala, for example, it's the same word. Okay, Yoruba, Igbo. Why? Because Africans are used to dealing with difference. So, so I, my personal view is that there's a lot of scope for solving some of these problems that we talked about. Even President Mobutu, you know, for all his sins, he tried to do that. What was this whole Zairianization, the Abacos suit, the, that, was an, the Africa, that was an attempt to create a Congolese identity, you know? Uh, many of these things, Pan-Africanism, you know? Uh, like at, in the, at the start, there were all sorts of ideas for creating different identities, bigger encompassing identities. And I think, you know, if they just get the space, Africans would come up with lots of ideas for how to create identities that would create very different political dynamics. You know, and that, that's true in Botswana too. This, you know, you go to Botswana, everyone will say, oh, you know, everyone is Swana. Rubbish. If you look at the last census that collected information on this in 1946, it was ridiculously heterogeneous, okay? They created that, they created that. Very good. Um, just to add to that though, I said earlier the other countries that are doing okay, Morocco is one. Uh, Morocco is definitely doing very well. It's not a constitutional monarchy, it's a monarchy. Uh, so the case is a little bit different, but in terms of economic indicators <coughs> and everything. Morocco is a middle-income country in the real sense of the term, not in the numbers what that I was challenging in the mm. way. We, but it's a real, you go there, you feel the boom. If you had been there five years ago, you go five years later, you see the change, you feel it. It's not on paper, right? So they're doing well in that sense. We take another set of questions. Sir, you have to come down to the microphone if you have a question. We have uh, three folks here that are already aligned. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, please try to go to the question. We only have about 12 minutes left. Yes, okay. Um, I was wondering what your all thoughts were on the recent movements against the gay and LGBTQ communities in Africa and how um, they might go about fixing that and making sure that everyone feels um, open and able to be themselves. And what's your name? Ad My name is Adia. Adia. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Keshav. Uh, we talked a lot about how the West has forced itself upon Africa, so they've not been able to form their own systems through colonialism and the effects of that. So what do you envis envisage the West's role currently in encouraging democracy in Africa? How should they go about doing so? And what policies should they be taking care of and going ahead with? Thank you. Hi, I'm Gabriel. I'm a first year in the college. My question is, what effects, political, economic, social, positive or negative, have you seen as an effect of the Belt and Road Initiative throughout Africa? Hi, my name is Hunter Adams. And a very quick question. Uh, in 2003, I was at the Africa Center in London, and Museveni, the president of Ghana, was there. A British reporter asked him, why doesn't he rescind the death penalty? And he said he's an Old Testament man. Now that's the frame for Bobby Wine phenomenon, right? It appears he didn't read Sung Tzu, Art of War, because that told me when I heard him say that in 2003, that that's the type of individual he was dealing with and he made a number of strategic mistakes. And so the question is, what can other young up and coming African intellectuals, leaders, uh, singers who wanna be politicians, how can they be more strategic? How can they have around them advisors who know um, deeply the um, politics, the consciousness 
of the people that they want to replace. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, in the back, do you have a question? No? OK. Go at it again. Professor, you can go first. Me? Oh, OK. Um, you know, let me tackle what should the West do. Um, is, that, is that OK? Yes, yes. Uh, I, you know, I think, you know, we, st we talked a little bit about this. You know, I think, you know, I used to teach at Harvard for many years, and a very good friend of mine uh, was uh, the great late Paul Farmer, you know, who founded mm -hmm. Partners in Health. And Paul never used the word development. He used the word accompany, okay? Like, development sort of reeks of, you know, patronizing, and, you know, everyone needs help. You know, everyone, think about the civil rights movement in the United States, okay? That was, that was a creation of exploited people in the U.S. South. But people from the North came. They came, they helped register voters. They helped bring resources. They helped them solve the collective action problem. They showed solidarity. They accompanied the civil rights movement without determining what it was aiming to do or how it did it. They, they helped, and I think that's the right model. You know, Paul had the right model, you know, we need to accompany people. Everyone needs help. I need help, you know? You know, like, so that's great. But how do you do it? You have to do it on their terms, you know? And, and, and uh, you know, I'm just, in, as a development economist, there's, I don't like the word development, but I have to use it because that's where we are, you know? As a development economist, I'm just horrified at the, you know, the, the paucity of input from Africans into this process. Who develop, you know, who determines the priorities? That should be the Africans that determine the priorities. And we, yeah, we have knowledge, we have resources, we have capacity. Great. We accompany them, you know, towards their goals. And, and so I think there is lots of scape, scope for engagement from the West. But the way it's organized at the moment is mostly pretty dysfunctional, I'm afraid. Ambassador, do you want to add? Something? I just want to add a short comment about what the West can do. You know, the African Union exists in Addis, it's based there, and it has members from every African state, except those who might have been kicked out for various reasons. I mean, that is a voice, and African countries have tried to police each other. ECOWAS, you know, also commented on the coups. One person said that coup in Gabon was one coup too many, but they couldn't enforce their will. So it's not just, everything doesn't depend on the United States or the UK or France or Germany or Japan or one country. I mean, Africans among themselves are also discussing these issues. I was really pleased to see that Kenya has just abolished visas for Africans visiting from anywhere on the continent. This came up when I was ambassador to Chad that this agreement was decided, but then it was quickly rescinded <coughs> because people were worried about security. Even really basic things, like how could you visit the country and sign trade deals if you can't get a visa without flying off to some other place to get it? So we have to be careful, I think, not to be paternalistic toward Africa. Africans have leadership in their own countries and they need to decide what is best for them. And I hope the African Union, they face the same challenge as the UN. They don't want to criticize a country. And if they do, then they might be concerned, well, we'll be criticized if we have problems in our country. It's, it's difficult. It, it takes a lot of courage to do the right thing. Okay, we have two more questions. We have the uh, Belt and Road Initiative question and the LBGTQ plus question. Yinka, any of that stuff speak to you? Well, well, um, it was about the negative or positive if, of the Belt and Road Initiative yeah, thus far. And then what it's, you thought of the LBGTQ thing in okay. Uganda? On the, on the Belt and Road, it's, it's obviously controversial. Lots of people get uh, distracted by it. But as far as Africa is concerned, um, it's, been, it's been mostly positive in terms of thinking about infrastructure. Um, that perhaps they, these countries were not going to get that support from the West, not, in, not with the speed or the um, support that the Chinese could do by also actually not just agreeing to, to build that, that bridge or that railway, but also supplying work um, expertise and the loans. It's a whole package. Now, of course, this becomes controversial because um, some countries 
clearly bit of more than they could chew, right? And or did it have some sort of long-term strategic vision for what they're trying to, do, what they what they're actually trying to do? So you get these situations where people build railways and then they get to a certain point, and then they go, oh, come, like this is what uh, Ruto was doing, President Ruto mm -hmm. was doing in Kenya, uh, um, in China last week at the forum. Oh, can you give us some more money to, to expect? But you've already built one. But why, how is that working, right? So, yes, um, there's plenty of talk, particularly in the United States or in, in the West, about, well, China's taking control, China's doing this, but actually it's always, we should always be thinking, asking that question of the African leadership itself. Like, if you are going to take these loans, have you thought through why you're taking them and how this is going to pay off? Um, so it ends up as this story about debt traps and all the rest of it, but actually, the, the, you know, I, my personal view is it, it depends on the, on the leaders themselves, asking, you know, uh, answering the tough questions. There's also an element to that, though. Um, so great power competition, the professor referred to that a little bit, in so many ways. <coughs> it's a new moniker we use a lot now in the West. Nobody was talking about great power competition when I was a student here. It's almost came about because of Russia, because of China, because of the rise of India on the continent. So in the West, we often, at least sitting in Washington, everything's about the US, right? Like this is a bad thing. If it's not benefiting mm -hmm. the US, therefore it's bad. On the continent, it's about choices and options. Yeah. Uh, the question is, uh, it, with choices and options, you also have responsibility to ensure that you make the right choices for your people. And I think we go back to that vicious circle of democracy, you know, outside governance, and what does that mean? Because then the people are often left with the bag, right? When the leader is moved on. Right. Uh, Ghana is struggling with that stuff today. Not long ago, we're talking about Ghana as an example. Ghana is heavily in debt now. Uh, Kenya is still moving forward, but they're heavily in debt. There's no country that is not uh, in that space. Um, the last question is about LGBTQ the hard uh, question, the hard uh, legislation that um, was passed in Uganda? I think this is a really, really tough question, and I thank you for raising it. You know, having served in various countries and heard from many leaders, it's not just leaders in Africa who would not change their laws. I mean, Uganda is an extreme case because of the death penalty, but many Africans <coughs> believe that any kind of queer, LGBTQI, use whichever term you want. They believe that it's wrong, it's against their beliefs, their religious system, and I, I don't see them changing their views very soon. Again, I always tell my students, think about America before we start you know, thinking about other places. There are places in the United States where being queer is not accepted. And many people who are, are victims of violence or microaggressions. I, I don't need to recount to you what some people might be experiencing in our own country. They aren't being executed, that is certain. But I also would say that it's useful, it'll be useful to watch religious leaders from places like the United States who are very conservative, who go to African countries as traveling ministers and say, well, you know, this is wrong because we have people in America who view, have a religious basis for condemning those people who happen to be queer. And they find a, an important audience in some African countries, not every African country. And as Africa gains greater voice on the international stage, I think it will be important to look at whether these ideas that are very much a discussion here how they end up playing out there. This is not one leader who said, I hate queer people. This represents a feeling from some people, many people in certain societies, not every society, in some societies. Yeah, thank you very much. Hunter Adams had uh, his question as well. I think it, the death penalty from Museveni showing up at the Africa Center. We have about 40 seconds. Professor, you want to take that? Um, I'm not sure I really got the question. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You know, Museveni showing up at the Africa Center in London. You should read the New Testament. And he was a man <laughs> of the New Testament. Yeah. <laughs> That's my comment. You get to, you know, turn the other cheek by the New Testament. All right. 
On that note, I think we're going to be around to take other questions as we mingle. Please join me in thanking our panelists today, Yinka Dekoke, Ambassador Passi, and Professor Robinson.